five, four, three, two, one. And we're on. Larry Marsh, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great. Thanks a lot, Randy. Well, I tell you what, um, it's nice to have a very smart person on the show today, somebody that can answer so many questions that I have uh, about economics, the economy, things that I just, I want answers to, but I sometimes just can't even find it on Google. So I'm <laughs> hoping we can uh, nail down some things that are really on uh, the minds of many Americans right now. And I, I really want to get right into this. The economy, Larry, um, after coronavirus, after everything that's going on, more announcement of more jobs not coming back. Are you worried at all? Uh, yes, absolutely. And um, it's because I understand that, that the economy, the money in the economy flows through the economy like blood flows through your body. And when you buy something, the money's gone. But as far as the economy is concerned, the money's not gone. It's just going around to the next person. It's traveling around and around. So there's this money flow. But unfortunately, in recent years, money has been, been getting diverted into Wall Street. So the people on Main Street aren't able to buy back the value of the goods and services that they're producing. And so the federal government has had to step in with deficit spending, with unpaid for tax cuts and unpaid for expenditures in order to fill in for the middle class people that haven't been getting enough money back in order to purchase the goods and services they're producing. So this is a serious problem and I have a solution in my book for that. So in, with your expertise, 30 years as a graduate and undergraduate professor at uh, Notre Dame, right next to my hometown in Chicago or not far, you have a lot of knowledge in here. When you see the economy and you've been, you know, you've lived through the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, when you see what has happened with the coronavirus and jobs that truly might not come back, um, what do you think is going to happen? What's your prediction? Well, I'm very worried because uh, the politicians don't seem to understand the system. And uh, originally back in 1913, uh, they were worried, that the, the, the um, people were worried that the politicians, if they controlled the money supply, would want to pay off all their voters by giving them more money and more money here and more money there and more money. So they decided back in 1913, it would make more sense to create a independent Federal Reserve where the Federal Reserve would control the money supply so the politicians wouldn't have their hands on the money supply. But the tools that the Federal Reserve were given back in 1913 only worked through the financial markets and did not work directly with the people on Main Street. So I have proposed in my book, uh, Optimal Money Flow, to have individuals have their own individual My America Prosperity smartphone account with a Federal Reserve Bank. So all the major banks have accounts with the Federal Reserve, but there's no reason in the world why all individuals couldn't have a banks with the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve could inject money into those accounts when it needed to stimulate the economy and let the people decide how to spend the money instead of giving the money to Wall Street bankers who just reinvested in stocks and bonds. So I don't think I've heard that before. So you're suggesting people have what some sort of savings account with the Federal Reserve or they put money into it or? Yeah, they can put money into it. Uh, initially, there'd be $1,000 put in each account, but you wouldn't be able to withdraw it till age 70. But you could withdraw any additional money, and you could you could put your own money in, and but you would only earn interest on the first $10,000. If you put $12,000 in, uh, you wouldn't get interest on the additional $2,000 because we don't want to compete with the commercial banks. We, we want to have a separate system. And when you put the money in the savings account, it doesn't get loaned back out again like a normal bank. The Federal Reserve would just hold on to that money. So if there's inflation is threatening, the Fed can raise interest in these accounts. People will put money into those accounts and the money will just sit there. So, so they'll, 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 they'll get interest on it then at a higher rate then? They'll get interest on it at a higher rate and it'll get the money out of the system when there's too much money chasing too few goods causing inflation. Now, would every American get that no matter what age, once they're born, they would have this Federal Reserve account? You could do it that way. I, I, I initially opposed that it, it started age 18, but you know, there's been all this stuff about baby bonds and everything, and perhaps it would make sense. But so there's certain issues that the politicians would have to work out, whether you get $1,000 initially or some smaller or larger amount, whether the cap on interest uh, 
uh, the money it earned interest on was 10,000 or 15 or only 5,000, that would be another issue. And, and at what age you should start getting this money, you know, getting these accounts is another issue. So these could be worked out politically, but the basic principle is that we'd be able to inject money directly into people's hands. And so they would, they would, the money, we would be able to control the money supply. And individuals have much higher marginal pence to consume in the sense that when they get money, they're more likely to spend it than the Wall Street bankers. The Wall Street bankers, their interest is in reinvesting the money into the financial markets because they've got as many cars as they want and many houses as they want. You know, getting a few more million dollars is like chump change to them. Right. So they're just reinvesting it because. But they wouldn't be allowed to steal these accounts, so to speak. They wouldn't be able to take this money and use it for roads or um, campaign funds yeah. or nothing like that, correct? Yeah. So the idea is, is that the, the, instead of having the politicians pay off, uh, you know, get paid off by the Wall Street bankers to rig the economy to benefit them, we're, we want to have a direct link to the people so we can get the money directly to the people without going through the financial markets. So let's talk about rigging the economy. A uh, good segue. Um, President Trump has been writing checks to the American people, um, several trillion dollars, and they're talking about more. Um, this is not a Republican issue because the Democrats were writing checks to save the economy not that long ago. Um, we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars. My question, Larry, uh, where's this money coming from? Because I know we don't have it. Right. We don't have the money. And the system was set up so the politicians can't just print money directly. They have to borrow the money. So only the Federal Reserve can print money directly. So that gave this independent entity, the Federal Reserve, control over the money supply so the politicians wouldn't have it. So we're just uh, borrowing money. And when the economy is at full employment, there's a crowding out effect that, that if the Federal Reserve, if the, if the Treasury, if the, if the politicians take the money, then the money's not there for the private sector. But when you're at unemployment, when there's a lot of excess capacity in the economy, then it's fine initially for the government to go in and, and borrow this money temporarily. But at some point, they have to decide whether they're going to pay this money back, you know, whether they're going to pay this back or not. But it seems futile to me because we've been doing this for 30 years, raising the debt, printing treasury bills with money we don't have, borrowing it from China, borrowing it from Japan. Um, how, how long can this last? I mean, is this, can you do this forever? And if so, why doesn't every country do it? Even small countries, just print your money. Who cares? Yeah, this is a problem is that they get carried away and they have politicians who are not professional economists who don't realize that there could be a sudden tipping point. Uh, so it's as long as the debt stays as not too large a percentage of the gross domestic product of the production of the economy, then it's not too much of a problem. But if the debt keeps getting larger and larger and larger, at some point, uh, people are going get, to get nervous and interest rates will start to rise. Now, if they rose slowly, we would catch on to that people were losing uh, faith in, in, in the ability of the Fed to pay back the money. But unfortunately, the way our economy works, it's often all of a sudden there's a, a big uh, lack of, of confidence and that that undermines the economy in an abrupt way that leads us to a sudden recession. And that's the real concern is that we need to have a control, better control over this. And we need to have the Federal Reserve have more direct control over this and not have the federal, the, the federal government, the, the politicians, spending all of this money without paying for it. Well, I, I thought I read the other day, Larry, that um, according to GDP, that now our debt has surpassed that or is going to surpass that either in this next year or next couple of years. Is that the tipping point? I mean, is that it? Well, it's not clear where the tipping point is, Randy. Um, we're we're, we're going to have to wait and see. But the, the f fundamental problem is there's too much money at the very top of the wealth pyramid. And the problem with that, I mean, it, you know, you can say, well, great, these people worked hard, they were in junior, you know, they, but the problem is it's creating a fundamental uh, problem of 
causing the interest rates to be really low. When you have that much money in, in the financial markets, uh, it's hard to find somebody that wants to borrow your money uh, and, and pay you a lot of money for it because everybody there's tons of money up there, but it's owned by the 10% the wealthiest people who own almost 90% of the, of the stock market. And so that money has been piling up there. But the interesting thing is that with poor people and middle class people, the absolute value of money is really important. I got to pay my bills. I got to, you know, have clothes for the kids. Uh, you got to have food. But as you get wealthier and wealthier, it's not the absolute amount of money. It's the relative amount of money you have. And because you start thinking that money means that you're worth more, that you're a more valuable person in some sense, because I've got more money, I must mean something good about me. So then it's really where you fall in the Forbes list of wealthiest people. What that means is you can tax the, the wealthiest people as long as you tax them in a way that, that is even, you know, even Stephen across the wealthy people, that you're not giving one wealthy person an advantage over another wealthy person. And as long as you do it even Stephen, they, they just care. There's been psychological studies showing that, that they will not reduce their incentive to work hard and to do do various things as long as they're not being cheated in terms of the ranking. That's what they're really concerned about. So the fact that this particular administration has been writing checks, it doesn't bother you? You're not worried about it? They should be doing it then? Well, I think right now they have to do it in order to, to, to restore the economy. Uh, what bothers me is that the politicians are doing it instead of the professional economists in the Federal Reserve. So like the Federal Reserve office in Washington has 400 PhD economists that study all of this and use all sorts of involved econometric equations to calculate what's going on, but they don't, the Federal Reserve doesn't have the tools they need to directly work with Main Street, as I've mentioned. Right. And so they really need to uh, incorporate these new tools specifically these My America Prosperity accounts, these individual smartphone accounts, um, which you can use to smartphone to smartphone transfer. You could, somebody rakes your leaves or cuts your grass, you can transfer the money from one to the other. Your employer could pay you through the, your Federal Reserve account. And it's a very secure account. So there's some very high tech blockchain methods of making sure these accounts are extremely secure. Um, but the main thing is enable the Fed to work directly with the people and not have to go through these, these, these financial markets to control the money flow in the economy. So you're, you're good on them writing the checks. They've got it. The people need to pay their rent, their gas bills. How about when we go back to 2008 and we were bailing out the banks and the car companies? Was that a good check writing system at that point, too, or bad? Well, under the circumstances, it was a necessary evil, but I think uh, too many of these uh, banks got away with some shenanigans and they, they, got, they got into some very risky situations and of course the whole too big to fail thing. And so there was, there was where there should have been a moral hazard problem, you know, where we should have fixed the moral hazard problem and made these people fully pay for what they did. Uh, instead, we kind of let them off for free, you know, get out of jail free, sort of like Monopoly, right? So, yeah, it was not a good situation. We, it was handled reasonably well, but, but we didn't really fully make the people face up to what they had done and, and not do it again. So we really need to break up a lot of these companies. And one of these, there's, there's a great book, um, called The Myth of Capitalism by Jonathan Tepper that should have been called The Myth of Competition because what he shows is there's tremendous concentration in all sorts of markets you wouldn't expect, like the beer market. You would think, oh, there's all these brews, you can brew your own beer. But in reality, the vast majority of beer that people drink is two companies. Only two companies control it. And eyeglasses, you'd think, wait a minute, it's yeah. just some plastic and some glass and they're yeah. charging. I know about that one sense and now they're charging 95 bucks or something yeah it's easy it's because there's only two companies that control this eyeglass market and it's it's really uh dominant throughout our economy where there used to be a lot of competition a lot of the competition has been destroyed and the government is responsible for allowing this to happen it's very unfortunate yeah and and listen i i 
I know so little about the economy and how it all works. I only know what I, I see. So I, I get real bothered by this spending and this debt, and I never seem to get an answer on it. And every time a new administration comes along, it's more spending, more spending. And, you know, this nonsense that Republicans are conservative, that is such baloney, and the Democrats are spending. I just don't get it. To me, it's basic math. You can't spend more than then you earn. But somehow every administration continues this insanity. And I just I just think it's the biggest thing threatening our country. Forget about Al Qaeda. I'm worried about the banks collapsing and the, the dollar collapsing. Well, the fundamental problem, Randy, is that the, the, the rich people and I, I hate to, to say it, my father was a Wall Street banker. So, you know, I, I didn't come from a poor family. Yeah, let's but, blame dad. Come on, let's get, let's get him. Dad. <laughs> they, they have too much. Now, in my day, uh, the Eastern elite was very um, cautious. They didn't get involved in politics and they didn't get their name in the news and they kept their salary modest because they, they believed in, in, in um, new, the, the uh, in how, making sure that there was no French Revolution <laughs> or no you know, revolt against the people. So they had a no, what they call noblesse oblige, where you, you had an obligation. So it was like upstairs, downstairs, Downton Abbey. You, you had an obligation to the, the other people, the lesser people, they might call them, but they, but they didn't try to crush the lesser people. Now, it's, I'm not saying that they're, they're trying to do it now, but around 1960, uh, there was this transition from what was really an aristocracy. The United States was, remember, women couldn't even vote until 1920. I know. I know. And, you had to be own property to vote. And and in order to get into Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Notre Dame, you had to have legacy. You had to have right uh, come, come from a family of uh, well to do. Sure. Exactly. So that was replicating itself. And but the people who involved in that knew they felt guilty because they knew they weren't the smartest or necessarily the best, but they were controlling everything. Whereas then when we started using SAT scores and ACT scores, and shifted from the aristocracy to the meritocracy, we thought, oh, everything's gonna be great now. But as it turned out, it got even worse because the people in the meritocracy who are really smart, these really smart lawyers and, and bankers and so forth, they could outsmart the government lawyers who weren't being paid very much and they could rig the system to themselves and they would make sure their kids had the best possible education and went to the best possible schools and so the meritocracy started replicating itself even worse than the old aristocracy. And, and so instead of having the American dream where you can uh, start, anybody can just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, what the scientists have found when they do the study is that it's very difficult for people who come from a family where there's, the parents have low education and have very poor to rise up above that level. And the people who are born to very wealthy family tend to stay there. And we are one of the worst countries among the wealthy countries in terms of this upward mobility. We have very poor upward mobility. So that's a very serious problem we need to address. And one way to address it and to get more of this money out of Wall Street is through estate taxes and inheritance taxes. And there's been Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who say, I'm not gonna give huge amounts of money to my kid you know, give them a basic amount, but they're going to have to learn to earn money on their own, just like everybody else. So there's some people that have understand the problem and are trying to deal with it. And that's where the money would come from to pay for infrastructure. You know, you can see in China, they're investing all sorts of money into their education of their people, into their infrastructures, uh, into the research. We need to do the same, but we haven't been doing that because of this debt problem, this federal debt problem. So we've got to get the money from somewhere. And these wealthiest people are the really where the money needs to come from, unfortunately. You brought up China. Good topic. Um, <laughs> the administration is pointing the finger at China. China is to blame for the coronavirus, blah, 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 blah. I, I thought before the coronavirus hit, and maybe you can correct me on this, I thought we signed a trade deal. I thought everyone was happy with China. China's the great country. We're going to trade evenly or more evenly with China. Um, do we not like China anymore? Help me out. 
Well, actually, I, I think this is a big mistake picking a fight with China um, because I think that we have been benefiting enormously from China. I mean, if you think about it, Randy, in really basic terms, the Chinese people took the resources in China and they worked hard to make products for us. And they sent us products at a real low price. You can buy them in Walmart, you can buy it at all these stores. And what did we do? We sent them back pieces of paper with George Washington's picture on it, dollar bills. <laughs> now, in theory, what would normally happen is those dollar bills would go out into the foreign exchange market and drive down the value of the US dollar, which would make our exports cheaper and make the Chinese imports more expensive because of the exchange, the dollar exchange value. But instead of putting the money out in the foreign exchange markets, the Chinese used the money to buy our debt, to buy our treasury securities in the New York financial markets. So the Chinese have over a trillion dollars, over $1 trillion of debt, of our debt that they have. Now they're investing the money back into our economy. So basically, they gave us the stuff, we gave them the money, and they gave us the money back. I mean, why are we complaining? This is, you know, they're financing our debt. Well, you know, you can say maybe it's not such a good thing that have all these foreign countries having influence on our debt. Uh, so that, that could be a concern. But as far as the, the real fundamental problem, Randy, is that the wealthiest, or at least the special interests in the United States, don't want to have a low unemployment. Because if unemployment is too low, then when a worker comes to them and say, well, I think I deserve a higher wage, they don't have some alternative person to employ. But if the, there's a higher unemployment, there's the, the reserve army of the unemployed, <laughs> you have that other person, you can say, hey, you don't like it, this other guy will take your job. And so they're concerned about not having to, they don't wanna to have to pay higher wages, and they're worried about inflation. They're worried they have a huge amount of money, accumulated all this money, and if there's inflation, their money would be worth less in real terms, in terms of what it can buy. So they don't have the interest in maintaining uh, a full employment for the most part. Now, in recent years, it's been less of a concern because um, the threat, threat of inflation has been diminished by this global supply chain that, that, that we're not driving up the, the, the price of goods and services because there's lots of goods and services available. So, so even if you have lots more money, there's still, there's still plenty of goods and services available. It's when the goods and services are short in supply that the prices start rising. And so we've been able to dodge the bullet. So the future with China is what? Are you saying it's good? We're, we're going to be trading with them evenly or more evenly? I mean, what? I don't know. I hear about trade deal and I don't, I don't even know what happened. That's how out of it I am, I guess. Well, I, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate that, that we're getting into this struggle with China. I, I think that part of it is this intellectual property issues. Right. That, they haven't respected the international prop the property issues. But these are about patents. And, and, and the trouble with patents is the original idea behind patents was to encourage innovation, to get a company to put a lot of time and effort into something which may take several years to develop a, a product, maybe a drug or some other product. And then you want to give them enough time to recoup that investment. But the problem is that instead of like seven years, these patents have been extended year after year after year. So some of them have been for 70 years or, you know, and so instead of encouraging innovation, it's actually suppressed innovation. And so there's research out there showing that patents, which are government monopolies, where the government has designated a monopoly to a certain company, then that has actually undermined innovation. And that most innovation occurs with, with individual startups and like through the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, they fund thousands of individual researchers who are much more likely to come up with something new because, I mean, Kodak, when it had its film, didn't want digital photography. Yeah. But no interest in that. And these fossil fuel companies, they pretend that they have some interest in maybe some windmill or some solar thing. But at the end of the day, their money comes from fossil fuels. So they want to continue the fossil fuels. So the big companies have a vested interest in the old technology, not in new upstarts and disruptive technology. It's only the, the little guys that, that need to be get some funding. And the National Science Foundation and National Institute of Health provide that funding 
to, to create that disruptive technology that improves our lives through innovation. Well, I'm sure the folks in Rochester, New York, wish they would have uh, embraced digital technology a, a little bit more and quicker because um, um, Kodak might still be around, right? Weren't they in New York there? Um, upstate yes. New York? Yeah. Oh, but l let me understand. It's, it, this is my thinking, though. Haven't we just sold ourselves out with China? You think back, Larry, back to the 80s and 90s. We didn't want to have dirty air because we didn't want to have the factories. We didn't really want to do the work. And then suddenly we found a way for somebody to do cheap labor. They could do it at a fraction of the cost. We didn't have to do the heavy lifting. We'll just do the marketing and they'll ship over the goods. We'll, we'll send our corporations over there. I don't know, 20, 30 percent, I think, of our jobs went to, to China and or our goods are produced there. But I, I could be wrong on that number. Isn't this really all about our own laziness? And shouldn't we just, the president said he would move these companies back. He's going to get these jobs back. Isn't that the real issue about all this? Well, one thing I'm certain of, Randy, is we're not going to get those jobs back because the reason they went there is because the labor was really cheap and the jobs were routine jobs that didn't require a lot of education to do those jobs. But, it was, but Larry, it was still a job, though. It still yeah. kept somebody employed in Chicago. Might have not been the biggest wage, but that person could live and pay their bills with that wage. Right. But the fundamental problem is that there's not a fixed number of jobs. Economists call this the lump of labor fallacy, that there's not a fixed number of jobs. We can have as we can expand our economy. And you've seen this in recent years when the unemployment rate has dropped to 3.5%. It's but the problem is that certain industries have been hurt and those people needed to be able, we needed to help them make the transition to better paying jobs and create better paying jobs for them and give them the skills they need to, to and we're gonna see this going forward, Randy, with, with the truck drivers. There's like three and a half million truck drivers, both uh, long distance truck drivers and around town truck drivers who are gonna be losing their jobs with, with all of this new technology, with the self-driving vehicles. And this is coming faster than people realize. And we need to be prepared and start helping to retrain people and get them into jobs for the future. Because China is already offloading these cheap jobs to Vietnam and, and other countries. And, and eventually they're going to end up in Africa, probably, with, with people doing these cheap jobs in Africa. We need to, to educate our people. And this is a crisis with our colleges and universities because they are running out of students because of our, our birth but, rates. But hang on, Larry, you're saying they're cheap jobs. Apple Corporation, all those jobs are cheap jobs. It's one of the most successful corporations in the world. Why why is that company not here? I don't get it. Uh, well, it, it is here in, in, in many respects. I mean, we do the, a lot of the design, the technical engineering work, but we send the, me the mechanical work over to China, and then they send parts back to us and we, re, we add certain aspects and send them back to them, and then they send them back to us again. So they're doing the cheap work, but now they're getting smart, and they're investing in their research. And so they're, they're smartening up their people. They're, and we have not done that. You know, it used to be that, that you didn't have to have a high school education. Right. And then required a high school education. Now it's getting to the point where we need to provide the funding for people to have their basic college education and get the basic skills for the 21st century and the 22nd century, we need to be looking forward to the future to make sure that our people have the training they need to compete with China. Otherwise, China is going to run us off the road, and it's not going to be with the cheap labor. It's going to be with the smart labor. Well, That's, but 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 these yeah. companies are to blame. You hand them, you know, the blueprints to everything you're making. We'll use Apple as an example. Of course, they're going to steal that technology. I mean, it's in their country. Um, I bet we would do the same thing if that was blueprints to something technical. and We didn't have it. We'd go, what the hell is that? Yeah. So wh wh we are to blame for it. We're, we're handing yeah. them over going, yeah, you guys make this for us and then you ship it back. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. But it's also true that we have not invested in, in our own people to be able to compete effectively, because pretty soon China's going to be, uh, you know, it, are we really going to be upset if China figures out how to how to solve the cancer problem? I mean, you know, China's yeah. moving 
the world forward just as we move the world forward with innovation, new ideas, new approaches that helps everyone in the world. And so, yeah, China's been cheating in some ways to some extent. But rather than get mad, I would just do better than that. I'm mad. I bring those jobs back, Larry. That's what I say. And we're going to. I would run them off the road by having better innovations. Okay. Here's a subject I know you can uh, talk about. Um, Colleges. You're, You're saying that maybe hundreds of colleges and universities may go bankrupt or go out of business. Why? Absolutely. The, the drop in birth rates has been substantial. And so there's two solutions. And the other part of the problem is that we've been able to get away, uh, get a, been able to be um, sustain our college populations for a while by bringing in international students. And the international students pay top dollar. So uh, locally, there's a little college that has about 1,000 students overall, and it had uh, 50 students from Saudi Arabia. Um, I had two students from Japan in my my course. Uh, These students pay top dollar, and they're, in effect, subsidizing the U.S. students, and they're bringing in the money that's needed to continue these colleges. And they also give the diversity that the students learn about, and more importantly, the, the international students learn about a democracy in America. So when I was a little kid, my first roommate in third grade uh, was from El Salvador. His father was El Presidente of El Salvador. He was actually the military dictator of El Salvador, but he liked to be called El President. (laughs) Anyway. Of course. And and the vice president's kid was down the hall. Anyway, the 20 Latin American countries back then were almost all dictatorships, but they sent their kids here and they learned about democracy. And now most of the Latin American countries are, are dem- democracies. So we have a tremendous influence around the world when, when they send their children to our country. This is a great advantage for us to be able to control the mindset of people around the world. And so we shouldn't lose that advantage. The other area that's very important is the poor people that can't afford to send their kids to college. We, we need to make more money available for them to be able to come to college and to fill in for the fact that birth rates have been so low. And so somebody in the inner city, instead of getting into a drug gang, they could come to college and learn to be an accountant. <laughs> you know, and they actually right. accountants pay more than the typical kid so, involved in a drug gang. So, Larry, you were a professor for, you know, some 30 years at Notre Dame. Um, what are you saying? Should college be more affordable? Is it not charging enough? No, the college needs to be more affordable. And there's tremendous income inequality across colleges. So the the well-known and wealthy colleges uh, do tremendously in terms of of money. So I worked um, for uh, a, in 2010, I was asked to come to the University of Chicago and teach them MBA courses. And I was, it was the quarter system. So I ended up going in, uh, you know, 10 times and teaching these two different courses, and I came back with $60,000. Well, at a small college around here, I was asked to teach a semester-long course with like 29 course classes. Um, so I'd go to, to the class 29 times and give exams and on homeworks and everything, and I was paid $1,700. Well, wait a minute, I'm getting $30,000 a course at Chicago, I'm getting $1,700 a course. I mean, you know, this is like night and day. Right. So the idea that that all these colleges and universities are the same and are the same situation financially is just not true. There's thousands of these small colleges and universities that are going to get wiped out um, because of the lack of students is the fundamental problem, not having enough students. So, so we, we really, need to, we need to beef up the birth rate. We need people need to spit out more children, is what you're saying. Then. <laughs> well, that and that the, the kids that are poor, because it's also solves the pro- other problem we talked about, Randy. We talked about the problem of them not having enough education to p- compete with China, and that they were do- still doing menial jobs. Well, we want to get people into you know it could be computer coding is one type of job, but there's lots of other technical jobs and interesting jobs and challenging jobs that they could be doing if they had the education that would give them the foundation for doing those jobs. And so getting those people, matter of fact, one of the most important decisions you make in your life is deciding on your parents, 
Do I want to be born to wealthy, educated parents? Yeah, I prefer I that. I, I put that request in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if you're born to poor, poorly educated parents, your chances of moving ahead are, are very dim. Yeah, you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, you're screwed. So, you know, there's a few exceptions and we always, yeah. you know, glorify Focus on those, sure. Sure. Yeah, but we need to give people a fighting chance, and that means giving them a decent education. But, but Larry, there's something like a trillion dollars of school loan debt out there just sitting there waiting to explode. If people don't have jobs, or I go to Notre Dame and now I can't get a job, um, is, is the school thing then just one big waste of time? Yeah, this is it's a big problem. We have to make sure that we have full employment. And that, that there's a big demand in the Silicon Valley and, and all of the innovative, uh, we talk about Apple Computer and Google, although some of these firms have gotten too big and they have actually, in some cases, crushed innovation. The larger firms tend to ha crush innovation. You remember these small firms, you know, uh, Steve Jobs was not working for a big company when he started up. You know, Bill Gates wasn't working for IBM when right. he started so when you go back and look at where these innovations came from, they didn't come from the big companies. Yeah. And a lot of these companies get so big, and then when somebody has a little startup, they buy it up and, and, and crush it or just take advantage of it, but they don't really encourage these, these startups in the way that if we had a more level playing field without these big companies dominating as much as they do. So I want to be clear what you do with the student debt that's out there and the price of schools. Just lower the rates or help fund every student or how do how do you go to school not have a big debt and get a good education so in well, short what would we do we need more public funding okay the state governments have been re substantially reducing the funding to the state schools the state colleges and universities in recent years so it's getting harder and harder for those state universities to operate because the, their funding has been systematically reduced. And so we need to guarantee that not, not that a student's gonna be able to pay for any expensive college, but that at least the basic colleges that can give you the basic skills that you need to compete. So once one has those basic skills, then they can, they can compete. It's, so it's really what we've discovered through research is that it's more important what you majored in in college than what college you went to. That if you have the right engineering skills, sure, right, in yeah. chemical engineering, whatever, then you're going to be in that business. You're going to be a, a good employee for the, those businesses, and and those skills are the key. But not and everybody's not smart enough to be a chemical engineer. And why aren't we promoting, you know, uh, other skills that you know the average person? Because most people, Larry, are average. They're average. They're they're not dumb, they're not smart, they're average. And I'm not sure that them going to, um, you know, Notre Dame is going to even benefit them in the first place because they're not gonna get through it or be able to get a degree that's actually gonna produce income for them later. Well, um, I think there's a wide variety of um, majors and, and minors in college and like nursing there's going to be a big demand for more and more nurses going forward. And so a lot of these colleges have really good nursing degrees where you can learn how to care for other people. Now, you know, you, anybody with reasonable amount of empathy should be able to learn the basics and, and be able to learn how to care now, for people. I had, I had friends that were in nursing programs. It was hard. They, it was a lot of people that aren't good in math and science. They would struggle through. I agree with you. That's where the jobs are. But the average American living in you know, Chicago, they're not necessarily smart enough to get through a nursing program. So I, I don't I don't know that the college is the answer, but you're saying make it affordable so that they at least have a shot to do it is what you're saying. Yeah. And, and you know, Randy, I, I work as a volunteer uh, in helping uh, students, in tutoring students and especially the uh, low income disadvantaged students. Right. And the one of the problems is they don't understand the potential they have. They don't have the sense of empowerment. So when I was at University of Chicago, I would I'd fly into Midway Airport, and then I would take the bus through South Chicago to get to Hyde Park, to the campus. Right. And I would see, see people on the bus, and one day, a woman got on the bus with two girls. 
And she immediately told them, just sit there. Don't say anything. What are you looking around for? You know, they, they were being intimidated, so they didn't have any sense of empowerment. When I teach, I try to teach my students to be rebellious. Now, of course, I'm a 60s guy, so naturally. I joined the NAACP in 1963, so I've been causing some trouble ever since. But I, I want my students, the, my favorite student is the one that sits in the back with his arms folded, waiting for me to make a mistake and say, Bob, you're wrong, you know, right. you screwed up. Yes, I did, good, thank you, thank you. Um, so I try to teach empowerment. So one day, a student came to me, a young lady came to me before class and said, oh, Professor Marsh, Professor Marsh, I, I, I could only set up this appointment with the doctor uh, in, right by, after your class, and I need to leave your class 15 minutes early. W -w -w -would, would that be okay? And I said, I thought for a minute, and I said, under one condition. And she said, what is that? I said, you need to sit in the middle of the front row. And when it comes time for you to leave, I want you to slam your book shut, stomp out, and say, terrible lecture. And then you can leave early. So it comes time for her to leave. She quietly closes her book and slips out without saying a word. At first, I'm upset. I'm thinking, I'll never teach a rebellion. And I thought, wait a minute. She didn't do what I told her. She rebelled. Oh, success at last. <laughs> You like, so, you like the anarchist. You like the person that's going to rock the boat a little bit or question things, maybe, is what you're saying. Question absolutely. it. In a good way. Right. Not, not shooting up with drugs that yeah. doesn't, help, and doesn't help anybody. Well, I won't beat that point, but I, I just think we're making a huge uh, mistake uh, about this debt with colleges. And, you know, I think colleges are to blame it to some degree. You know, now you've got to have an Olympic sized swimming pool. You've got to have the best football stadium. You've got to have a health club at the school. Um, you know, the teachers need summers off, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think the colleges are also doing themselves in. And I just think this is all going to go back to the debt. I think this is all going to implode uh, uh, soon. I really do. I just don't see how everyone can just borrow thousands of dollars to go to school and then somehow pay it back with a, you know, twenty five, thirty thousand dollar a year job. I, I just don't see how it's going to work. Yeah, well, you're right, Randy, that in, in Europe, the, the universities don't have these huge sports teams. It's, it's a different situation. You can, you can play sports for your city or, or in some other, out, something that has nothing to do with the university, but they don't have these huge sport teams that um, dominate the U.S. universities. So, yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, I my where I went to school, Arizona State University. I walk around the school, and and it's and it's impressive. It's beautiful palm trees lined down the main drag. Uh, everything is manicured. New science building going up. New law department. Blah blah. And you know the football stadium is one of the biggest anywhere. And I just sit there and think. I mean, I'm proud of my school. Go Sun Devils. But who the hell's paying for all this? Yeah, yeah. I know who's paying for it. Mr. Lone, who just, uh, you know, now that now the uh, student population is up to like 70,000 at Arizona State University. How are these people going to pay this back? I, I, I don't get it. Yeah, we need to get more money into the hands of, of the people on Main Street and less money into the hands of the people on Wall Street. That's the bottom line. But there's too much money piling up on Wall Street and not enough ending up on Main Street. Let's talk about a subject that uh, just somehow pisses the Democrats off to no end. Um, Donald Trump and not paying or not showing his taxes. Donald Trump right. not showing his taxes. Can he do yeah. this from from an economic standpoint from where you sit? Can he just say, screw all of you? I don't need to show you this. Well, this is a very interesting uh, issue. Because the one question is, why doesn't he want to show his taxes? And you might say, oh, well, maybe he was dishonest. I don't think so. I suspect that he was perfectly honest and followed the law to the letter. And, and, and so you say, well, maybe he doesn't want people to know that he didn't pay any income tax. And I would say, no, I think he's proud of the fact that he didn't pay any income tax. As a matter of fact, he would want people to know that he was smart enough to not have to pay any income tax. So the idea that he had done something wrong or that he didn't want people to know that he didn't pay income tax, that's really not the issue. The issue is why was he able to get away without paying income tax? That's yeah. the real issue.
And when we look at that, we can see there's specific loopholes, uh, Internal Revenue Code 469, Internal Revenue Code 482. So the specific loopholes that he took advantage of. Randy, do you own any property? Um, just one. Okay. And do you rent out that property at all? No, no. Oh, okay. Well, then you wouldn't be uh, under Internal Revenue Code 469 because you, ha you have to have done property management. And you have to have done 750 hours of property management during the tax year in order to take advantage of this loophole. So, and this doesn't mean cutting your grass and, and, and raking your leaves. This means it's financial transactions of renting it out, finding renters, you know, doing the transactions with the bank. If you spend 750 hours or more or hire someone to spend 750 hours or more on your property. So if you have a $100 million property, then you could write off $4 million on your income tax. But the whole idea of this write-off was your property depreciates over time. Right. You ever notice the roof, the, the, the shingles on the roof start to wear out over time and maybe the around your windows the, the, it begins to rot? Well, if you don't rent out your property, then you don't get take advantage of this. But the idea was to compensate people for the depreciation of these these rental properties and so, but the problem is, is that if instead of depreciating, your property actually appreciated, let's say that the original property was $100 million, but now you bought it from somebody else who had it at $100 million, you bought it for $200 million. Now, instead of writing off 4 million, you get to write off 8 million. Now, wait a minute, this was supposed to be designed to help people whose property depreciated. But the way the bill was written is when the property appreciates, you get even to write off even more for depreciation. The property doubled in value, which is an appreciation, and you got to double the amount you're writing off in depreciation. I mean, this is about as perverse as you could get. These loopholes are designed for the property developers, like President Donald Trump, right. to not have to pay the income tax. Yeah, and let's be clear, he's not doing anything illegal. It's the law. So he, you know, what you're essentially saying is if we probably got a hold of his tax returns, he probably did nothing illegal, but we'd probably see years where he paid zero or very limited amount of taxes. And it's going to anger a lot of the American folks. Like, how is that possible that you made a billion dollars and you didn't pay a penny in tax? And it's even worse with Internal Revenue Code 482, because if you have a brand name and I in the book, in my optimal money flow book, I use the brand name Sterling, but you could use the brand name Trump. And what you do is you've got this brand name that you've established, but then you decide that you're going to sell your brand name to a company in the Cayman Islands. So you sell your brand name to the company in the Cayman Islands, but then you need to use your brand name. So you have to pay that company in the Cayman Islands some fee for using the brand name. Well, how much of a fee? Well, that's a pretty good brand name. I'm going to have to pay a lot of money for that brand name, which which reduces that goes on from your revenues. It reduces your profits. So in the United States, your profits have dropped dramatically. There's only one catch. You know who owns that company in the Cayman Islands? You do. You've got <laughs> the rest. That's You're a company. good one. I like that. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. this, this is cool. I have students that uh, that served in the Internal Revenue uh, Service for for 30 years or so. And I check with them on all this and they say, yeah, it's really hard for us to evaluate these brand names and, and, and this type of, and then there's inputs. If you are a manufacturer in the United States and you're producing um, inputs to, into your products in other countries, then you can pretend that those inputs are worth a tremendous amount. And then that reduces the revenues because that's a cost that reduces, that is subtracted from your revenues and calculating your profits. Yeah. So then tricks and so what's really happening, Randy, is you and I have to pay for that aircraft carrier. These we're pay, you know, somebody has to pay for the aircraft carrier. If if these other people, these these wheeler dealers are not paying their share, we're paying their share for them. We're paying our own share plus their share of that aircraft carrier. So we're getting screwed. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Well, and I always think the uh, Democrats sort of um didn't articulate these types of points very well. They just always said, let's, you know, let's clamp down on the rich. And really what they should have been talking about are a variety of tax loopholes like the one you're talking about. That's really what uh, going after the wealthy you need to do because you're created a world where 
they're going to pay no taxes. And then to me, this all comes back down to my initial conversation uh, about debt and who's going to pay for the taxes, who's going to pay for the roads, who is going to pay for all the things that need to be done in the United States when many very wealthy people and large corporations are going to pay zero or very little in tax in taxes. Who are you going to collect the money from? Well, I'll tell you, Randy, it's not that I have anything against the wealthy. I came from a very wealthy family. Uh, my father, as I said, was a Wall Street banker. His father was a corporate lawyer in New York, and and they were very wealthy. As a matter of fact, my my father, we lived in Westfield, New Jersey, and every morning my mom would take my dad to the train station to take the train into New York, and I, she would take me along, of course. And then I noticed as we stopped at the was one uh, street, the one stop sign, there was a bus stop, and this was in the 1950s. And my father was would wave to this man, who would then wave back, and this w went on day after day after day. And the thing that I found unusual was the man was an African American. And I said to my father, because I didn't know any African Americans, it was very segregated back in the 1950s. And I said to my father, well, who is this man that you're waving to? And he said, oh, I don't really know him, we just waved to each other. And I thought, well, that's very strange. And then one day my father told, took me along because my grandparents had died and they had left the estate, the, they had a large estate and so he took us to the estate, or took me to the estate, and he talked with the butler, this African-American butler. And the African-American butler, as soon as he saw me, he said to my father, oh, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Marsh, you need to take your son to the emergency room right away. And I said, well, you know, my father said, why, why? He said, oh, his thumb, it's, it's going to go gangrene. It's all swollen, it's red, you know. And so my father said, oh, okay, okay. So my father took me to Orange Memorial Hospital, and the doctors looked at it and they injected me with uh, needles to with with a uh, put something to stop the gangrene, and then I realized this African American was very smart. He saved my life. So first thing I did when I get to college is I joined the NAACP, because I realized that this man had saved my life and he was very smart and that they were not being treated fairly. They were people were making it sound like that the African Americans. And then I realized why my father liked the African American so much. When he was a little boy, he was, these were his good friends, the, the children of the servants were his good friends. So now in my book, just to show I'm really not hostile towards wealthy people, is I have a- Oh, a I don't think, wait a second. I don't think you're hostile towards wealthy people. What I'm saying is that these loopholes need to be closed up because somebody has to, maybe I was misunderstood. Somebody has to pay the taxes. Somehow the roads got to get right. paved. Uh, right. the, the city services right. need to be done. The airports need to be rebuilt. So what I'm right. saying is that as long as you allow people, large corporations to not pay you know, a, a significant tax bill or some tax bill, right. how are you going to pay for these things? Where are the tax revenues going to come from if you don't tax people? Because we're writing checks for people now. You know, we write a check now. We're paying off the uh, the problems we had in 2007, 2008. We're bailing out the banks. We're bailing out um, um, uh, other services from when we had that economic problem. Um, the car companies. Where is this money going to come from if nobody's contributing to this giant fund? Right. So we really do need to, to tax the wealthier people more. And I think especially the estate tax and the inheritance taxes, but other taxes as well. And as long as we do it on a very fair basis. And the other thing, of course, is getting rid of these tax loopholes. The, I mean, not even, you know, Warren Buffett explained that that uh, he was only paying like 17 percent tax. And the, the, the his office help was paying much higher rate of, of, of income tax. So. Uh, he was thinking, gee, he has all his billions of dollars, and yet he's paying a much lower rate than his office staff. Yeah, and I so, think that's the point I was alluding to that, and, and maybe I just wasn't clear on it, but uh, the fact that, um, you know, a lot of these corporations have these loopholes, and they're, they have a year or a cycle where they're paying zero tax. And I think, I just think, the average American is thinking, oh, you know, yeah, you just want to tax the rich. No, I think you really want to close these loopholes so they pay a fair tax. And that's why the flat tax has been an interesting, you know, discussion over the years. When you buy a yacht, you don't get to de just uh, deduct it. You pay the tax 
on that purchase, uh, just like you would anything else as a sales tax. So it's interesting. Yeah. Well, there's no uh, tax on these financial transactions. When I'm buying stocks and bonds, I don't pay a tax. Yeah. And yet other people have to pay tax for their bread or, yeah. or you know, whatever, they, whatever they buy. Which is uh, bizarre. Yeah. So there's a distortions there that were the loop. They're not just loopholes. There's a whole bunch of, of rigged. The system is definitely rigged, but it's rigged in favor of the wealthiest people who, in some sense, got too caught up in it. It's not that they're evil people. It's just that they got too caught up in the game. The, no, the, 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 and, and, and where I, that's where I was saying I think the Democrats are going after it the wrong way because I agree with people that are wealthy. How much do you want to tax me? 50, 75 percent? What's the number that you're going to be happy taking away from me? And I don't think that's the way they should have been um, – uh, framing the argument, what they should have been talking is about these tax loopholes, uh, as you pointed out there. That's really where, um, you know, the money should be coming from, uh, not the average rich American, just because they uh, make good money. They shouldn't be taxed at 75 percent. It didn't work in Great Britain, and it's not going to work here in America. You can only take so much money from these people. But when you're not paying, uh, you know, like what you ex explained with the uh, real estate, I think that's where you can collect better tax revenues. And even these 75% tax rates are only on the, or they're marginal tax rates. That's not the average tax rate. That's the, the additional money above and beyond a million dollars or $5 million or $10 million. It, that, that high rate only applies to the dollars above a certain level. So the rich people are getting taxed at exactly the same rate as the poor people on the first, you know. Yeah, amount. right. So it's really the marginal tax rate and the average tax rate can be can much, much different from one another. Yeah. And bottom line is we, we, we somehow have to collect taxes and we have to pay for things. So I, 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 I don't get it. And that's why, you know, I'm not an economist. Um, you know, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do you predict for the U.S. Uh, economy um, after this coronavirus? Are we headed towards a recession, depression or as the stock market indicates some days, um, everything's fine? Well, unfortunately, Randy, there's two economies, and the since uh, almost 90% of the stock market is owned by the 10% richest people, and the Federal Reserve only has tools, for the most part, in dealing with the financial markets. It's done some business loans recently, but that's very unusual, and it's, it's limited in what they can do there. But there's two different economies, and so the wealthy people see the stock market going up and they say, oh, this is wonderful, the economy is great. But then the, the real economy, the, the Main Street economy, there's going to be unemployment for some period of time. It's not going to come bouncing back. Uh, I think there's just too much disruption and the Congress is too confused. They're not being careful about how they proceed and they're not giving, putting the money in all the right places and doing it in a systematic way. And I think all this confusion and chaos is going to hurt Main Street, even while Wall Street comes bouncing back. So in terms of stocks and bonds, I think the economy will recover uh, fairly well. In terms of Main Street, I think it's going to be some time. And that's why I propose this My America Prosperity Accounts as a new tool for the Federal Reserve to use to get money in the hands of people on Main Street and stop having the money being diverted to Wall Street. That's the fundamental problem we're facing. So the rich will do well, but are you thinking recession, depression? I'm, I'm, I'm forcing you. I'm, I'm, I'm making. I think there's going to remain a, a recession in the sense that there's not going to be the full employment. There's not going to be the full bounce back. There's going to be a lot of unemployment, and um, you know now it may get to twenty or twenty five percent, but then it's going to slowly come back, and it could be ten percent for a while. Um, okay. Unemployment. And we're not going to get back to 3.5% for a long time. Uh, that's a funda fundamental problem that we have to face. Larry, the name of the book is what? It's, it's called uh, Optimal ah. Money Flow. Optimal Money Flow. And this is where you can go to look at it and get look a sense at you. of it. So that's the, that's the key thing right there. That's op optimal-money-flow.website. All right. So, well, Lots of fun. And I want you to think more about the debt in America. I, I'm, I'm, you're not as concerned about it as I am. I am, I am frightened of the amount of debt. So I want in your next book, I want your chat, your whole book to be dead, dedicated to the debt. Okay. 
Okay, we'll discuss that in very detail in the next book. <laughs> okay. Right? Well, Larry, really... thank you so much. Uh, interesting conversation. Wishing you the best, and um, thanks for your time. Well, thank you. You do a tremendous job. I've enjoyed all your shows. The the one on uh, Mark Yaffe, the 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 uh, the um, Native American who oh, was com comedian. Remember, Sure. Yeah, the comedian, he was confronted by someone that said, you know, he's a Native American. And the guy confronts him and says, you should go back to your country. And he says, this is my country. I, I am in my country. Yeah, I'm funny guy. Country. Yeah, I thought that made me think that the first undocumented immigrant was Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never really thought about that. That's really true. Number one. <laughs> All right, Larry, thank you. We are out of here. No more roach on Florida TV.